afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the noonday gun has just gone off here in our Cape Town studio, where we are based, and it signals the start of our weekly webinar. My name is Neil Peterson. I'm the founder and content-in-chief of Real Estate Investor, South Africa's leading independent real estate content and education platform for more than 16 years. And we, we're really passionate about serving the South African real estate investor, the industry, and uh, and the business community through our digital platform, rei.co.za, our monthly digital magazine, Real Estate Investor, and our virtual webinars, events, and in-person events as well. So welcome to our regular Thursday investment webinar brought to you by Real Estate Investor, and I'm delighted to be your host and moderator for today's webinar. And today's topic is your guide to UK investing, how South Africans are capitalizing on UK buy-to-let opportunities. So more about that topic and our guest panelists, who I'll introduce to you very shortly. First, some housekeeping. And for registered attendees who want to view the webinar again or who could not attend today's live version of the webinar, we will email you a link of the webinar recording. Alternatively, anyone can access the webinar recording on the rei.co.za website under the Education tab. You just click on Event Replays and select your webinar choice for viewing at your leisure. I want to encourage all of you, our valued audience, to actively participate and interact with us and during this session. And if you have any questions for the panel, please don't hesitate to ask. To do that, you just submit your questions uh, to our guest panelists in the Q&A box, it's located on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, not the chat box, that's for general comments, and uh, we'll deal with your questions throughout the webinar in our Q&A uh, panel session, which is in the final session that we're having. So let's move on to the heart of today's discussion uh, for our webinar, your guide to UK investing, how South Africans are capitalizing on the UK buy-to-let market. So let me briefly introduce our three panelists to you and our first guest is Sophie Gamble she is UK property investment specialist from Leo Global or Leo International who has many years experience in UK property investments she's also a content contributor for real estate investor magazine on UK property investment in her monthly UK investment column so Sophie welcome and you want to briefly introduce yourself to the audience <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully, I can provide some helpful insight into the UK property market. I think there are going to be people listening to this who may be considering buying investment property overseas. And for those of you who may have thought as a South African, it was not even possible. Hopefully, this webinar will show you that it is not only possible, but also an excellent option if you are looking to diversify your wealth. I thought it would be helpful to start with to give a very brief intro on what we at Leo and International do with regards to offshore property investment. Most South Africans that I'm so speaking to... Sophie, I want to just get through to the panel introductions and we can get into the deep and dive. And I know I'm really excited as you are to get over this. So I just want to get through to the other panelists too quickly. So our other next guest panelist is Greg Stockton. So we'll come back to you, Sophie. Don't you worry. I know you're passionate about this game like I am as well. So uh, uh, Greg has over two decades of international real estate experience uh, with wealth management, business development. He's now a global residential UK property expert, and he makes the UK property market accessible for international investors and delivers well research UK investment property to the very best international partners. So Greg, welcome. And you want to also briefly introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you. Neil, thank, thanks for that introduction. I think that's quite hard for me to beat in all fairness. You've pretty much said it all. Um, but you're right, Global Residential, we're a leading property investment company. We have a, a proven track record in developing a, a, a kind of diverse and exciting range of real estate projects. And we work with some big international financial advisory firms and property companies like Leo um, to provide them with quality real estate opportunities for their clients. So, yeah, thank you for the invite today. I look forward to uh, talking a little bit more about the projects that we have and, and how we can help. 
absolute pleasure. Great actually having you on board, uh, Greg. And uh, our third guest panelist is Shirag Lakani. He is a cross-border tax and finance specialist, also financier in background and founder of the Ravensburg Group, partner of Leo International Independent Advisory Consulting Firm. They provide tax private client office advisory consulting services. He's a qualified CA, has a good understanding of foreign exchange regulations, international finance. So, Shirag, welcome to you. You want to yeah. introduce yourself briefly to the audience as well? Thank you. And I was a senior partner at Baker Tilly in South Africa, pretty around the international tax desk when I was there for about 10 years. I did most of the sort of inward and outward investment in and out of South Africa. Uh, you know, core specialization now is advisory for high net worth families in terms of cross border structuring, exchange control, um, wealth, and effectively generational changes and do you know luckily i get to do quite a lot of work with leo and their clients as part of the process wonderful well it's great actually having you on board Shirag, and we look forward to the discussion and we're really thrilled to have these uh, uk property experts today share their knowledge experience and unique insights and uh, do offshore property investment and we're going to delve a little bit more specifically into the world of uk buy to let property investing and we hope by the end of today's session so we encourage you all to engage with us to fire your questions away. So Sophie, we're going to come back to you. So Sophie, before I really interrupted you, you were giving us such a wonderful introduction. <laughs> and Thanks. I said, can you maybe give us give us that whole introduction that you started off so nicely in terms of what you do? Because, you know, people are going into a daunting world of UK property investment. You know, some people are really scared even investing outside their own province. So do you want to maybe just to give us that intro again? <laughs> Yes. So what I was going to say was that most of the South Africans that I'm speaking to do find it a rather daunting prospect. So it's really important to have all of the information necessary to make informed decisions when you are thinking about buying property overseas. It's actually more straightforward than people think, especially if you have the right company to guide you along the way. And I feel that there is an assumption that it is very difficult to take ground offshore. And this is why I want to ask Shirag, because he's our tax, tax expert, his opinion on this. Yeah, so I think there's been, the, 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 you know, there's been, there's been quite a lot of white noise in the, in the market about SARS and the current regulations in terms of out of the, out of the investment out of South Africa. You know, the biggest misconception at the moment is that you can only take a million rand a year or you can only make 10 million. There's been a huge relaxation of exchange control in the last two years. So the starting point is you can take a million rand out a year without question per, per adult in South Africa, as long as you're a South African tax resident. Thereafter, what was the original 10 million rand annual cap has now been extended to effectively an unlimited amount. And a lot of the noise in the press related to when that relaxation came in was that there's now these vindictive audits by SARS of money going out and, and all those various processes. And actually, it's not the case. The reality is SARS have got a standard process that they follow. The Reserve Bank has pretty much fallen out of this process, and they've placed a lot of the compliance regulations back onto, onto SARS. And to be very open, SARS are very are very uh, are based on the concept to follow the process, submit the documents they want, and within three to five weeks from submission, you'll have your tax clearance. Their main issue is make sure that you and your related entities and where the money's coming from is tax compliant. They can show where the money's come from. And so long as you can show that, they don't actually ask additional questions. I mean, I've done applications with three, four, five hundred million, and they've approved it without a problem. So, you know, so from my, from, just to go with what Sophie's saying, as it comes to the exchange control exit from South Africa, you can take what you want, get your documentation in order, submit it in the format that they want, stay on top of it, and within four, three to six weeks, you've got your approval to take your money out. And all you then do is you provide that to your Forex bank to pay your money out, and you can transfer the money out where you need to. Okay, I think Thanks. it's such an important uh, positioning up front because, you know, there is that perception that people cannot move their funds out there. And maybe I think from your side, um, I think, Sophie, if you can maybe just share, because obviously we've jumped straight into the finance thing, you know, very, very quickly. And I think people just need to understand, first of all, I think maybe what's out there, what is the kind of yeah. investment. 
and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, how much money do they need to move out? You know, what is the mortgage? So it's all related to mortgage finance and everything else they can get. So maybe you so, just want to just extend on that. Yeah. Yes. So, so as a company, we at Leo International are helping investors to build property investment portfolios, primarily in the UK. And we're providing all of the information for this process. We have an amazing and an extensive UK property network that we're working with, and we're really proud on this webinar today. It's really important to, to me, to us as a company, that we deliver an exceptional product because in that way, you give investors the best potential for good yields and capital growth. And as a company, we are here for the long run to ensure our clients can steadily build up a successful property portfolio and therefore build generational wealth. I feel that one of the main reasons the process where to buy in the UK, what to buy, who look after it, how will you collect rent, uh, the tax side of things. So it can seem quite overwhelming. So we provide an end-to-end -end service and manage the whole property journey to make it an an easier investment option and yes it's not as straightforward as signing an online form like you would for let's say bitcoin i mean the uk has got very strict regulations in place for anti-money money laundering so you need to provide source of funds to show a trail of where your money has been generated whether that's a house sale or savings from earnings but once you've completed that process most investors find that Bricks and mortar in the UK is one of the safest options for preserving capital, and you have the added bonus of the rental income. I think another uh, factor just to mention is that there is some concern about putting down deposits when you're buying property, I mean, especially when it's a new build. So there are options in place to buy apartments from developers who offer 100% deposit protection and some that offer rental guarantees also. So this does take away some of the concerns and becomes a very attractive option for South Africans who want to take some round offshore. Okay, so great. Neil, coming back to your question about the, the finance, I'll, I'll cover right there. But I want to get to Greg, because now Greg, you, you, you're actually dealing with a lot of clients all around the world, including South Africa. And uh, and I know you 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 are an expert, particularly on the actual locations of where to invest and how to invest. So maybe just give us a little bit of background, you know, as to to what you're doing, who you're helping out, you know, sort of worldwide, and and how you can start helping out South Africans getting into the UK property market. Yeah, thanks, Neil. It's a great question. I think to, to allude to Sophie's point, there's many people that do want to get their finances overseas and UK property is always a good staple asset to have in the portfolio. But you're right, it's like, okay, well, I want to buy in the UK, where do I buy? And you know, a lot of time we get asked, I want to buy in London. And I always respond with why? And they say, well, it's the only place that I know. And so I think, first of all, it's really important to give that sort of education around you know, where you should be buying in the UK. As an investment-led company, um, we tend to look at different key reasons to why an investor should choose a location. Um, so first of all, obviously, price points are incredibly important. Um, not everyone's a multimillionaire. Um, and, and obviously, we have to accommodate from an entry-level property right the way through to that high end. So obviously, looking at price points is key. And um, looking, obviously, at the rental yields and where can we get good rental yields. And um, at the moment, most people know interest rates and mortgages have gone up. So if you are going to take lending, you need to make sure that your property is going to generate you enough yield to cover those mortgage payments. So that's really important. Um, and, and thirdly, is there any regeneration going on in that specific area? Um, and the reason that's incredibly important is because as an investor, yes, you want to keep your wealth safe, uh, but you also want to grow it as well, right? You want to know if you're buying a £200,000 an apartment in maybe five or 10 years, you can sell that for two fifty or three hundred. dollars and whenever you're investing into a city or a town when there's lots of regeneration, i.e. there's lots of government money going in, local council money going in to develop roads, commercial, residential, um, then it's always a key indicator that that's a good place to buy. So as an investment-led company, all of our projects are positioned in areas which tick those boxes. Um, some are off-planned, some are completed, depending on what the clients want. Um, and essentially, yeah, we're looking for that growth and, 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 that, and that rental yield. 
Okay, great. I think uh, good positioning there. A little bit later, I'm going to ask you to, to delve more into the specific areas, you know, and what's actually going on in the UK property market, because I think it's so important just to get a little bit of understanding on that. But great intro on that. Thanks, uh, Greg. Shirag, I want to come to you. Now, I know your background is in finance, but you're a tax expert and you're based in South Africa, you know, and you've, hel you've helped a lot of South Africans before, in fact, to 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 invest offshore. So, 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 where from a from a what are some of the tax benefits that we can talk about? And I know, you obviously, Sophie shared some of the big, you know, in terms of rental income, etc. That secure, uh, the capital grows, that kind of stuff. That that. So, so maybe you just want to talk about what are some of the tax benefits? And I think you know you you also initially started off with the whole finance story, and what your experience is with in terms of property finance, and then we could also bring in. Sophie, a little bit later, just to share her uh, experiences with her getting mortgages and the amounts. Cool. So, so the nice thing about South Africa and the UK is the tax regimes are very, very similar. Obviously, if you're buying these investments in your personal name, you would have to render for tax in the UK, but then render that the net profit in, in South Africa. Uh, th there is a slight differentiation between the UK and South Africa in terms of Interest, there is a slight interest limitation in, in the UK on personal on, on residential properties, but however, you, you get that critical credit in South Africa. So you get it, it's not as complex as people assume it to be. It's a you literally would file a very basic UK return and you would just render whatever that is in South Africa. Obviously, if we're starting to look at larger property portfolios, we would then possibly look at structuring it, getting the debt deductions properly done in the UK. It goes back to the complication of how someone would do it, but from a from a base perspective, with the exception of certain limitations the UK has in terms of deductibility of interest, the rules are very similar to South Africa and the UK in terms of rentals and how they get recorded and how you actually deal with them in your, in your, in your South African tax return. Okay, great. Okay, um, so Sophie, have we got Sophie? Do you, we yeah, haven't lost Sophie. Off. Okay, we just dropped off, Sophie. Well, hopefully we'll come back a bit later. So I think, Greg, we're going to come back to you. Um, Sophie, you're back on. Can you hear us, Sophie? <laughs> I'm so right. sorry. I'm having serious uh, internet issues. This is definitely not the BBC studios over here. <laughs> not a problem. Okay, can you... Uh, so maybe let's come back to you uh, again, Sophie, just with regards to... The, the the process i mean because you know somebody's going to now invest in uk as a south african it's quite scary it's a, as i mentioned it's a different country different laws you know how's who's going to collect the rent you know how, how can you assist investors address that but also more importantly in terms of financing the properties and getting mortgages how easy or difficult is this and you know i think we Sophie has dropped off again so we'll come back to Sophie so Greg I'm going to come to you so Greg if you can maybe just elaborate what is actually happening in the UK property market because you've got a good understanding you touched on the London you touched on you know in the north what where are the sort of the hot spots or, or recommended areas in the UK um, that you would recommend South African investors can get involved in and, and why Perfect. Um, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, Neil, um, we get a lot of, uh, I guess, initial inquiries into London due to it being the only place that people know. And um, certainly from an investor-led perspective, if people are looking for our advice, we do tend to steer away from London, um, which I know that might sound quite odd for somebody that only knows that is, is the sort of main attraction for the UK. But um, from a rental yield perspective, it's quite difficult to, you know, sort of break through that 4% barrier. Um, which again, you want to make sure that you know you are kind of north of five, five and a half, if possible. Um, and again, from a from a regeneration perspective, yes, there are lots of regeneration projects going on around um, London. Um, however, you know, from a price point perspective, we do feel there's better value elsewhere. And um, we're extremely bullish on Manchester. And um, that's probably our second requested city, um, mainly from Manchester United fans and Manchester City fans, forgive them. Um, but it is our most requested city. And and for obvious reasons, you know, there's 80% of the FTSE 100 companies now are based in Manchester, and that's growing every single year, uh, which is fantastic. 
Um, you have, you know, five major universities um, based in, in Manchester as well. So we have a lot of clients who are looking further down the field for education planning, you know, get on the property ladder now for their, for their children. Um, and you actually have what is considered actually quite a small city. So there's this big push from the Manchester City Council to develop those city limits. And therefore, you've got a lot of regeneration going on as well. So we're very, very bullish on Manchester. Um, it's definitely our favourite city to invest into. Um, but then from an entry level perspective, we have a fantastic project in Halifax, which is a, another city um, which is going through regeneration as well. You get a lot of value, very high yield from that. Um, and then if we're looking at maybe something where a client wants completed and tenanted stock, so maybe not off plan, um, we do try and look for those commuter belt cities, possibly into London, where you can still get some value. So say very bullish on Manchester, but we also have those satellite cities as well. OK, excellent. Sophie, you're back. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on 5G. I don't think I can get back on 5G. <laughs> so I, actually, I missed a lot of the conversation, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating, but I really wanted to make an example of a South African client who bought a property through me a few weeks ago, and I think it would be very helpful to demonstrate the mortgage that she got and the figures so that people who are listening can understand that it is actually a lot more straightforward than, than you think. So a few weeks ago, I sold a property to a South African school. Team. She had a pre-approved mortgage from a UK lender, and they're giving her a 60% loan to value at 7.25% fixed rate for two years. And I want to demonstrate these, these cal calculations because, as I said, the figures prove that even in a more challenging market, the UK property is still providing a really good investment choice. So her monthly bond repayments are £580. And if I add on the other costs on top of that, so £58 for her management fees and £96 for her levies, the total outgoings will be £734. Now, I arranged with the developer of the property she is purchasing to give her a guaranteed rent. And this is just in the very unlikely event the property is not rented because it was something that she was concerned about. Now, I just wanted to add here that not all developers offer this, but I went to meet with the developer in July and they were happy to be accommodating. So back to the calculation, the client was offered a guaranteed rent of £725 per month. Now that does mean that worst case scenario, she'll be in a cash flow negative of £9 a month or about 200 grand. But when this property completes, because it's it's a new build, so it's still being renovated, when it completes, we are going to ask the management company to put the property on the market at the same price as her outgoings in order for her to break even or stay in a positive. However, she has actually been offered a lower rate mortgage from another UK lender um, under 7%, which would put her in a cash flow positive from day one. However, this lender, they are only offering this from the start of next year. So we're going to have to see if it works with the timings um, and the completion of her property, because that's due at the end of this year. But it's just showing that um, a South African school teacher has been able to get a UK mortgage and she is therefore able to buy her own apartment in the UK, which will hopefully from day one start to give her a rental income. Yeah, wonderful. Am I still so, yeah, no, excellent. No, that's great. I think you know it's a very practical example because you know people need that sort of hand holding uh, process to happen. You know, it's it's not you know we need the expert out there. We need you guys out there to assist us. You know, and uh, we're going into a new jurisdiction, so very important. Shirag, I want to come to you. You've you've had quite a lot of experience dealing with people who are investing from south africa into the uk and you know what are some of the the challenges that you've seen that some of the uh investors that are looking to to move offshore what are some of the challenges that you've seen that some of the investors have had and and and, and what sort of solutions in the personal capacity it's quite limited because in the personal capacity it's it, it's like south africa if you want to buy a property you literally sign for the offer you sign for it and it goes ahead based on the transfer you would need to register for UK tax based on the rental income, which is one complication. 
where we have found it, we have structured some, some investments through UK companies. It does complicate a little bit more, but that's no different to what's happening in South Africa with these beneficial owner registers that allow the new thing in South Africa. All South African companies now have to register the beneficial ownership. Obviously, the UK is a little bit more advanced than that. We just need to, if you're going to be doing it, we need to get all the beneficial ownership documentation on file with the UK um, company's house. And again, the biggest issue that we're finding, but again, it's not limited to South Africa, is very, very stringent anti-money laundering regulations in terms of verification of who you are, verification of source of funds, and making sure that you're not connected to any uh, particular, you know, to, to, to anyone that's been involved in sort of gun, drug, drug, drugs or money laundering or connected to someone in government. But again, even if you are, as so long as you can justify other things, you can get through the process. So I think that's what's been taking a lot more of the time. It's more, more satisfying the anti-money laundering regulations, more so than the actual investment or the tax side of it, because the law firms in the UK are very, very meticulous and very detailed prior to letting any transaction go through. The other big complication is that they are going to, they are very particular about where the money comes from. So we cannot use funds coming from third-party bank accounts for the investment. They they insist on the money coming in from the from a bank account in the name of the investor, be it a company or the individual, and being able to verify it all the way through. But again, if that's all done, the process is more just a time effort thing and then just runs through the entire process as required. Yeah, excellent. Because I think you know you mentioned up front, you know, about the whole money movement thing and there's obviously a process that you've got to follow and you assist people in, in obviously making sure that they can. You know, just going back to it, it's no different now to buying a property in South Africa. The law firms here are becoming very stringent in terms of their KYC, in terms of the PICA. Yes. Pretty much around the world, it's, it's, it's clamped yeah. down. And the reality is you just have to have the documentation in a certain tick box format that people can feel comfortable that, that you are who you are. Yeah. Okay, excellent. No, well, that's important. I think, and and it's it's a it's a global thing, and it's very interesting. That's you know, correct. I think FICA and everything is just it's only a local issue and what have you. No. It's a global issue, absolutely. And you're also feeling global uh, pressures very much like we in uh, in this country. Greg, I want to come back to you because uh, let's 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 drill down a little bit further into those properties. You know, um, you know what kind of property I'm going to get. You know, what kind of pricing I'm going to pay. What kind of you know, what do we get for, for our money in, in Manchester and in these other areas that you are recommending where South African investors invest in? Maybe you can give us some, you know, run a few numbers and and and, and, and the type of, whether it's flats or, uh, you know, houses or, or townhouses or terrace houses or whatever it may be. What, what do we get and what are the kind of price points that you're working with? Okay, would you mind if I share my screen to do that? It's probably no, a all. little bit, bit, bit easier. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Um, okay. Can you can you see my screen there, Neil? Is, yes. that, is that okay? Yes, perfect. Okay. Perfect, you can see it. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so so this just gives you uh, one of the examples of sort of an entry level uh, project of ours. So this is based in Halifax, um, where again, we looked at uh, the, the sort of regeneration that had taken place. So there's been about 200 million plus pound already sort of plowed into the city to, to improve that, say, that, that residential, that commercial uh, transportation links. And this is actually an old worsted mill. Um, so it's from the 1800s. Uh, we're direct with developer on that to convert uh, the whole mill into 58 apartments, a mixture of one bedrooms and two bedrooms. Um, you'll see on the price point there, you know, £117,000, um, which is the starting level for the apartments, um, up to around about £230,000, where there's two sort of semi-detached houses on there. So the average price point being around about £130,000, one, one one And um, the rental yield expectation of that is 8%. Uh, for a standard rental, so it's it's very high from a from a yield point of view. Um, so yeah, you know, you put that into rand terms. You know, what's one hundred and seventeen thousand, one hundred twenty thousand pounds today? I mean, it's the rand exchange rate moves quite quickly, but you know, you're talking what two two and a bit million uh, rand. Um, if you were cash buying it, but as Sophie's alluded to, there is lending available, so you'd probably aim to about half, um, sort of maybe forty percent of that. Um, and that is a very unique project because the payment plan is quite interesting. We can exchange on just 5%. 
So in order for a client to secure a unit there, they'd be paying roughly around about six to seven thousand pounds straight away. And then they can actually pay on a quarterly basis the rest of that deposit um, over the 18 months of that conversion, uh, which makes it quite palatable for South Africans, especially if they're concerned about FX rates at the moment. You know, people don't necessarily want to transfer 30, 40,000 in one go, but actually doing maybe 100, 150,000 every quarter uh, might make sense for them. So we love this project. We've just started selling them uh, and the project should be ready in, in around about 18 months time. Um, for somebody that's maybe looking for more of a cash buy opportunity, um, we have a project in Wellingborough, which Sophie knows very well. I think her family member was, was the mayor or something, Sophie, or something strange like that anyway. Yes. Um, hi, hi, Sheriff. <laughs> this, 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 the hi, Sheriff, that's right. So this project sits about 45, 55 minutes out of London, um, which again is, you know, within the hour commuter belt. Um, it's already fully completed. It's tenanted, so it has people living in there already. So straight away when a client's buying these units, they have that tenant already paying rental. Um, already achieving about 5.7 to 7% rental yields. And again, the price point, very conservative, 135 to 215,000 pounds. And then lastly, sort of our hero project, um, which is, you know, that Manchester uh, development. Um, the Manchester City Council, I've got a 15-year plan um, to regenerate the whole of the Victoria North, seven suburbs, 15,000 homes. And um, we've managed to take the tallest tower of three within that first suburb, uh, which is uh, Victoria Riverside, completes in Q3 2025. Um, the developers are listed developer. They've been on a stock exchange for 47 years. Um, but this payment structure on this is 10% this year, 10% next year, and the rest on completion. But those deposits are fully protected and insured by the developer as well. Um, this this is going to be a monster project. It's the it's the biggest re redevelopment zone in the north of England at the moment. Um, and just to put the price into context, that's three fifty is for a two bed. Um, and if you compare that to Deansgate, um, which has already gone through a lot of regeneration in Manchester, twenty five months ago you could buy a two bed in Deansgate for three fifty. They're now worth four hundred and sixty thousand pound, literally within two years. So the fact that you're getting a two bed here for three fifty. Um, I think represents incredible value. And as that project delivers different suburbs and different properties, of course, you should see the the increase in that capital uh, capital stack as well. So yeah, we we love all of these projects, um, but these are our sort of three core that we work with Sophie on. And um, of course, happy to take any questions from anybody on the uh, on the Zoom. No, absolutely, no, great. Thanks very much for that, Greg. Um, I mean, it spells out a lot what's happening. I remember when I started off this magazine back in 2007, they, they were selling London apartments for about £150,000. I mean, it's unbelievable where the prices have shot up. And, you know, and, you know, just inflation is actually on the inside of the investor over here. So now we're mm -hmm. looking at Manchester, you know, 175, 200 plus 350. So which just shows you the incredible, you know, returns that you can get from a capital perspective on, on property. Well, when you, I mean, you think the, the target or the, the sort of estimation for Manchester is that it will do the, just the economy in Manchester, not property prices, the economy will grow 25% um, over the over the coming five to 10 years, which is huge. Um, when you consider the average price point for a property in London is just over 800,000 um, and the average property price in Manchester is around about 300, just over 300. So it's, you know, it's, it's half under value of London. I don't, obviously it's never going to be a London, but it's definitely the UK's second largest city. And there's just so much going on there. It's uh, it's an incredible investment area for sure. Wonderful. No, incredible growth. And I'm going to come back to you, Sophie, because, you know, Sophie, you're the one that's been dealing with a lot of South African clients. And so where's the appetite there? Where's, where's the, what are, what, are, what are they calling for? Maybe take us through some of the finance examples because, you know, of somebody. So give us your Well, I wanted to, I, I don't know if I asked um, this earlier, but um, whether Greg had discussed what's going on in the UK property market at the moment, because I was really keen to just give a bit of an update on that, if if that would be helpful. Because no, absolutely, I'm not. Sure yeah, if, 
<laughs> yeah, because I'm I'm not sure if you've been um if the guys listening have been keeping track of the UK headlines, but the UK property market has actually taken a really positive turn in the last couple of weeks. Um, a lot of us were expecting the UK bank rate to increase, and they actually made the decision to keep it at 5.25%, which has given massive relief to the mortgage market. And there was a surprise drop in inflation last month. So it's it's actually got into a really good position and the rental market is still absolutely booming. But rents in the UK have seen a massive surge. I mean, they've been outpacing previous records. And I don't know if Greg touched on this earlier, but to give an example, a large proportion of our investment stock is situated in Birmingham, where we've seen rents go up almost 40% in just three years, which is nominal. So there's a lot of appetite coming back to your question, Neil, for mm. these northern cities. London is it's ridiculously expensive. Obviously, it's our capital. It's always going to be a good place to invest. But if you want to get into the UK market, it's better to start off smaller in areas that are a bit more affordable. Birmingham, Manchester, other northern cities, which are seeing phenomenal growth. And these are the really exciting places to start thinking about investment. OK, absolutely. So, um, Shirag, if you dealing with clients on your side have you seen some great returns from people who have successfully broken into the uk market i mean you obviously have been advising them from a tax perspective the best thing i can I tell you is I, I bought one myself with sophie so that's wonderful <laughs> I, I, it's the best Good example i can give them so, and, and and more so than that i mean look obviously you know sort of reiterating what sophie and greg have said with my perception of the clients is you know, London's more a vanity purchase, whereas if you're actually after a proper bricks and mortar, you pound-based investment, you know, going to the north where the yields are, the yields are much higher, well, absolutely, definitely the way to go. And, you know, you, I think you're in very good hands with Sophie and Greg in this process. Mm. So let's just let's just talk a little bit. That's that's great. That's wonderful. I think that, that gives a lot of confidence to a lot of investors out there. Let, let's just talk a little bit about exchange rate uh, here, in Chirac. Because look, I think we're sitting at uh, oh, it's a twenty four rand, close to twenty four rand to the pound, which uh, and you know, and I remember working with some investors back in twenty twelve, uh, which we helped to, to invest in offshore jurisdictions, both in pounds and U.S. dollars, and. We've seen, you know, the rand drop quite significantly over the last few years, and uh, and and maybe you could give us your sort of crystal ball outlook. I mean, you know, where the rand's going to go because is it going to improve or is it going to get worse? And you know, and <laughs> because a lot of people at that time, I remember 20, 2012, it was probably fifteen or twelve. I think twelve rand to the pound or thirteen, um, and and I think it was eight rand to the US dollar or something like that. And and now it's it's twenty rand almost to the US dollar and twenty four rand to the pound. So, mm -hmm. what is your kind of and I know it's a little bit of a sort of a throw throw it out there. What is your prediction certainly on on on, on currency the rand versus a pound going forward? So Neil, I'm not an investment. I'm not a wealth manager. I'm not an investment advisor. And I'm definitely not a forex predictor. Um, I, 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 but my concept with my with my wealthy clients has always been risk and currency diversification. I think that the general consensus is you cannot try and predict which currency is going to go where, how it's going to go, is the RAND going to strengthen, weaken, and a lot of it. I mean, being very cold about it, the RAND is a barometer for emerging market sentiment. You know, the move, huge movements in the RAND actually ironically have nothing to do with what's happening on the ground in South Africa. It just happens to be the most tradable liquid emerging market currency in the world. So if every, everyone thinks that Argentina or Turkey is going down, the rand gets pummeled. If, uh, you know, also with our free flow of money, you know, much as there's there's exchange control for South Africans for foreigners, the flow of money in and out of South Africa is very very easy. So they love investing in the JSE, they love South African bonds, they love the yield, which means that they'll pump in billions of dollars in a particular month, and the next month they don't like it, and all of a sudden it gets pulled, gets pulled out again. And I think this is what the nice thing about the way Sophie's selling the process is, yes, you can fund it cash, but great, you've got a pound-based investment, and I don't think you can constantly revert back to how many rands I had or spent or what the currency was doing. 
I view it from a much more important perspective of a currency diversification. And it doesn't matter whether you've got euros or dollars overseas. You know, the pound is still a relatively major currency in the bigger process. So you've got a you've got a pound-based investment giving you pound-based returns, and that's the risk diversification that you're getting. You're getting risk diversification of what one of the fifth largest economies in the world in a, in, in the currency that it's generated. And it just would form part of a bigger portfolio for the average investor. Not, not, not. And again, like I said, I'm not answering your question about the rand, but I can't answer it because I don't think anyone no, sure. knows what's actually yeah. going to happen. But yeah. if it's viewed as part of a material risk diversification process, then absolutely, that's what you are for, and that's what I think Sophie's biggest selling game is: we're giving you pound-based risk diversification with a pound debt, pound-based debt, if you want it with pound-based mm. earnings. You're almost mirroring your, your your income and liabilities in terms of that particular currency. Yeah, excellent. I think well put over there. Thanks for that, Shirag. And Greg, you, you're you dealing with, I mean, you're not only dealing with South Africans, you're dealing with other investors in other countries as well. And, and also, I think sometimes their currency is also a little bit under fire as well because, mm -hmm. I mean, the pound sterling has been a really strong <laughs> currency for a long period of time. And it mm -hmm. gives an investor sort of this peace of mind. As I mean, Shirag took he jumped, he took he plunged, he took the plunge. <laughs> so mm -hmm. certainly, you know, what is it that you see with your investors out there in terms of you know buy the the actual investors who are buying the property over the years? I mean, tell us about your happy clients. <laughs> yeah, no, look, very, very, very happy clients. I think you know, when I first moved to South Africa in in, in twenty fourteen, and we were having conversations around property. The same hurdle kept coming up. Right, I'm not going to transfer at 16. I'm going to wait till it gets back to 15. A year later, I'm I'm not going to do it at 18. I'll wait till it gets back to 17. The year later, I'm not going to do it at 19. I'll wait. And 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 that same pattern is, is just repeated and repeated. Um, and and I think the reality of the, the conversation that we we have with clients, or we certainly should be having with clients, is let's forget the rand exchange rate for a second. Why why are you doing this? Why are you even contemplating money mo moving money overseas? And, and nine times out of 10, it comes back to protecting my family wealth. Um, you know, it, it, there's no one that's ever been able to convince me that the South Africa Rand Sterling is, isn't going in one direction, which is down. It's been repeating that pattern for 20 years and it's going to continue to go down. So if, if you believe at some stage your children or your family will reside, live, need money overseas, it's, it, this is not a case of an investment. This is an insurance policy. Um, your children are never going to turn around to you and go, I wish you hadn't transferred out at 24. They're going to go, thank you for transferring out. Um, and I think it come, you've got to be very careful of, you know, not to get necessarily paralyzed by the exchange rate, but actually just think about the long-term benefits of how you're protecting your wealth for your family. And um, I mean, I'm just, I'm going to very quickly share, because I think it is a, is a really important graph here um, for, for people that have been sitting and waiting. I mean, that just shows the last 20 years sterling dollars and euro. Um, and then just over the last 10 years, if you look at what UK property prices have done, they've gone up 64% in 10 years versus, you know, 36% decline in sterling rand. So sitting around and waiting for exchange rates isn't making you any money. Making a decision taking action, getting invested into a good asset. That's what makes you money. That's what protects your future wealth. And that's what people should be doing. Okay, excellent. I think uh, that's that's a good way of putting it there. Thanks for that, Greg. <clears throat> we, I want to get to some of the questions here, which, uh, which are coming in. So I encourage the audience, please, to submit your questions. Um, so, I, and some of them have actually been answered in, in the discussion, but if you don't mind, we, we can maybe just reiterate some of them. And I see, Greg, you've responded to the one with the minimum amount required to start investing. Obviously, it's related to the, the price of the property. I don't know if you want to just elaborate on that again, just for the, just to, to deal with that particular one. I think maybe I'll let Sophie answer that one. It's probably... Okay. Uh, All right. So, probably... Sophie, do you want to handle that? What is the minimum uh, yeah, amount? Sorry, just, yeah. Um, so, minimum, I'm just opening up these questions hi what is the minimum amount required to start investing okay yes yeah. so we um we had a property for sale which was 117000 pounds it's actually been sold to some to a south african now they are taking a bond 
finance from the UK. So they will be investing in round terms, probably just over a million rand in order to, to get this property. That would include as well the transfer fees and um, also some of the legal costs. But you'd be looking really, I'd say, at about 1.5, 2 million rand in total in order to buy property in the UK if you are going to take the advantage of the UK bond finance. Okay. All right. So there's a lot of other questions here related to rental returns, break even, that kind of stuff. Do you, do you want to probably just uh, elaborate a little bit about that? Um, you know, what are the what are the rental returns that you could look at and when can you expect to break even on, on, on a property over what period? Okay, so so yeah, so something that I covered a bit earlier on was that, for example, this property that we are offering South Africans in the north of England, one of which was sold recently to a South African, her bond finance is um, going to cover 60% of the property purchase. So she's going to be putting in 40% and she'll have to pay back a repayment of £580 per month for that bond repayment. And the rent that she's been guaranteed by the developer is £725 per month. So with the other costs on top at the moment, she is looking at a, a negative cash flow of 200 rand, but that's if we with the guaranteed rent from the developer. What we want to do is once the, the property is ready and rented out, is put it onto market for 730 pound order to ensure that she breaks even is and is not in a negative. But going back to what I said earlier, worst case scenario, she's in a negative of nine pounds because she's getting guaranteed rent. But again, I just want to really reiterate here that the UK is absolutely just seeing phenomenal growth with rental at the moment. It's the market is booming because of the inflation. People are not looking to buy so much. They are looking to rent. Therefore, landlords are able to push up rents. And we've seen in areas 6% growth um, within sort of half the year. It's just it's just gone a bit mad, to be honest. And anyone that you talk to in the property world in the UK is just saying, you know, we we hope in a way that they can they can cap it because it's just getting a bit out of hand. But it's great, obviously, for for the landlords. And so once the mortgage rates start to ease, which we're seeing, then we're going to see a very be in a very good position where you're paying less for your mortgage repayments, but yet you're getting these very good rents coming in. Okay, just give us a little refresh refresher on the minimum uh, down payment. Uh, is it thirty thirty percent or forty percent thirty? Um, uh, and you know, and what you could look at paying for for the mortgage on the mortgage mortgage bond, as we call it bond here in South Africa, mortgage UK, same thing. So, um, sure. do you want to just elaborate on that? Yes, so South Africans can borrow up to seventy five percent loan to value from the UK lenders. Look, I mean, to be honest with you, even as a non-resident, I mean, I've been offered 80% loan to value. So sometimes you can get more than 75%, but I think it's safe to say in most cases, people would be looking at around 70%. So they would need a 30% deposit in order to purchase something in the UK. I think it's because of your accent there, Sophie, that they decided to give you that extra 10%. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so on a serious <laughs> note, yeah. So I think also coming through to um to back to Greg again. Greg, where are you seeing um, you know, the majority of interest, which area, which is like kind of like number one, which one people are saying, let's go, let's go, let's go. That's the one that's working for me. I want one of those, or I want a few of those couple of those because there are investors that invest in more than one so so where is it where is it happening in your world so from an interest so from a, um, a rental yield perspective i mean the average in the uk now just in the last 12 months is about 14 percent increase so average across the uk rents have gone up 14 percent. so you know to harbour on sophie's point it, it kind of sucks for the for the tenants but you know, the landlords are, are, are fairly happy. Um, obviously, different uh, rental yields in different areas. It, it's very difficult for me to put my finger and say, this is absolutely 100% the best location for anyone to be invested into because 
it, it's really client specific. And, and I think that's really important to get across to the people that are on the call is that everyone's goals and ambitions, capital stack, you know, risk tolerance is going to be very, very different. Um, and I think where Sophie's uh, company does extremely well, and, and obviously we help support that is to, you know, stage one, sit and listen to what that client needs, what they want, what they have. And then based on that, go and find the property that suits them. It's not just, you know, finding anything we've got available. It's actually listening to them. Um, and then, you know, further afield from that, once we do find them a property that, you know, ticks the box for rental yield, ticks the box for capital growth, and, um, you know, then between myself, Sophie, I and house lettings and management company, we can make sure that we find a good quality tenant, um, a professional tenant, um, or, you know, a sort of a, a highly educated student that's maybe doing a master's, um, and then make sure that we can manage that property, manage that process um, from an end-to-end -end perspective. So, Look, any, anything sort of in, in the north would be the sort of generic answer. You tend to get better rental yields and, and the capital growth is extremely good. Um, but as I said, it is very, very client specific. We don't really enjoy, you know, the sort of investment scene around London. But if a client wants it and they're passionate about it and these are the reasons and we agree with it, then OK, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll go and source it. But uh, yeah, I know that's a, a little bit of a long winded answer. But no, 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 not, a, not answer at all. There. I think it's it's a bespoke. It's a it's a bespoke deal, which which I Correct. think makes sense. All right, yeah. so let's another question. Yeah, if someone wants to get into the UK property market, which property companies in South Africa are the links? Now, I, I think I know where this is coming from. I think a lot of South Africans are saying, well, you know, if I'm going to invest offshore, you know, is the money going to be safe? Is it going to disappear? What are the links? So it's almost that Sophie's on the ground in Cape Town, in South Africa. In fact, she's national, yeah, operating, yeah, looking after clients. And if we look at Chirag, he's also based in, in Cape Town at the moment. And, uh, and and he also helps clients nationally around that. So I think let's maybe just think of it in that uh, context. If someone wants to get into the UK property market, which property can, are the links do you want to, maybe Sophie, you want to have a crack at that? And Shireg, you want to mm -hmm. add on to that? So I think um, my understanding of that question is, yes, if you're going to be buying a UK property, then is the company behind it. So what we would do as a company is, as Greg mentioned, you speak to uh, an investor, potential investor, who is looking to take X amount offshore, they want a property in the UK. So we would look at what budget they have. And then what we would do is talk about some of the options available. You know, would you be happy to look in the north of the UK as opposed to London? Because London's not, as we said earlier, the cheapest option. And then what I normally suggest is that a client, I put them in touch with a bond, um, a mortgage broker, who we use a lot, very good mortgage broker, we've got different options, who would then speak to that person and see what they would be able to borrow from the UK lenders. And then you'd know roughly, okay, you've got a budget of X amount, so you're a bit of your capital, plus however much you can borrow. Let's look at what properties are available. Let's look at the yields that you could get from there. And then we would go, go with that. But to, I mean, to go deeper into that question, I only ever use developers that I have previously worked with. I used to work at a company called Savills in London for eight years. I've been working in investment property for 15 years. So I only work with developers that, as I say, I've worked with before or that I know have a proven track record of delivering the best products. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's so important that you have a product that's going to be there for the long the long run to give you the good yields and to give you capital growth because that's fundamentally what you want to do when you're putting capital into the UK you want to grow it so that's what we're looking at doing for our investors excellent great okay so uh, great answer and uh, question for you Shirag and it's related to obviously bank accounts and that kind of stuff how do you open so obviously somebody for the first time they need to open up a UK bank account and uh, and uh, you know how would that work from South Africa in the name of and in this particular instance, John Paul Oakman is actually saying, well, if it's in the name of a UK limited company, then you know we're directors are based in South Africa, so that's a slightly no, different. Here's the problem, and we we are. I do find this quite regularly. Um, if John Paul reaches out separately, we I've got a couple of options for a couple of service providers that do do them. We've used them very successfully for exactly these type of situations. 
And it does, it's not necessarily limited to the property rental we do. This, but they actually specialize in transactional business bank accounts for, for UK resident companies. So you can just reach okay. out to me and I'll, 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 I'll walk you through the process. Okay, excellent. Great. So they can get that uh, that assistance from that side over there. And then our final question before we finalize uh, uh, the, you know, we, we all say our final words. So what about letting and property management? How do we manage that being in South Africa? This could be tricky. Who wants to give it a go? Sophie, Greg, not quite sure. Who wants to give it a Thank go? Thank you, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and that as part of what we do as a company, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we manage the whole property journey for a client. So all of those um, those aspects, getting on finance, managing the property, who do you speak to about tax? So that's everything that we will help and hold the client's hand with. So with renting out the property, for example, every developer that we're or every developer that we're offering to clients is also an, a management company that will be on board with that to manage the whole process so they would vet the tenant I mean we're lucky in in the UK now because we're in a position where you put up an application for a rental um sorry you put up um a, a rental and you have multiple applications so you can actually be picky about what kind of caliber of tenant you want to rent your property so the management company would select which tenant they can get you involved or not involved it's up to you as the client and then they will manage the property look after it they collect the rent and then they put it into your bank account or save it whatever you want to do with it and um they look after the property so it is essentially a hassle-free investment because someone's taking care of that aspect for you wonderful great thanks very much sophie i cannot believe it that it's we've almost reached the bewitching hour i can and uh so i'd like each one of you just to give your your final wrap your final words uh and um you know maybe your parting shots give give somebody a little bit of Final advice, you know, to take it forward to invest in the UK. So I'm going to start off with you, Greg. So if you can give us your parting shots, your final thoughts to our audience today. Final thoughts, Neil, are just do your research. Um, make sure you're working with a company that has links to good solicitors, good developers that listen to what you need and want. And um, don't stress too much about FX rates. Remember the reason to why you're actually thinking about moving your money overseas in the first place. Uh, and when you find something that you, you that does make sense and ticks all the boxes, just execute. Don't wait around. Um, obviously, we, we love supporting Sophie's business um, and we're happy to help wherever we can. Wonderful. Thanks very much for, for being on the show there, Greg, and those wise words as well. Thank you very much. Shirag, your final thoughts, your, your parting shots, please. Definitely something to look at. It's not as complicated as people make it out. And, and please don't get caught up with the media hype related to SARS and exchange control. It's not, most of it is not true. So you can move your money. That's the most important people. And I, I need to move my money. <laughs> I correct. Well, talk to Sharag. Talk to Sharag if you need to move the money. And then last but not least, Sophie, you got the final word. You could say, you got Thank to you. give us your Thank final you. parting shots over here. <laughs> well, Firstly, thank you to everyone for listening. And secondly, just to say, I am in South Africa. This is where I live. I'm based in Cape Town. I go to Johannesburg. So I am on the ground if people want to meet and speak about this in more detail, because it's I know it's much nicer to meet in person rather than doing these Zoom calls. I'm not based in the UK. Um, so and the other thing I want to say is that UK inflation is easing, which I mentioned. The UK bank rate has not increased um, as we expected. The mortgage rates are improving. So I think it's safe to say we're at the peak of the UK mortgage market. And I personally feel when it comes to the UK property market, whether the interest rates go down, it remains as sturdy and strong as it's ever been. And if you look at the past 50 years of the UK property market, this is something Greg showed me actually the other day, 43 years have seen positive growth. So it just reminds us of the resilience of the UK property market, and it continues to offer stability and opportunity to investors. And um, I think the best time to buy UK property was yesterday. So <laughs> that's, that's all from me. I agree. 
I mean, you know, if we just have to look back at, you know, what the exchange rate was before and, you know, so that is absolutely excellent advice. The best time to buy the property was yesterday. The second best time is to buy it is today. So, you know, yeah. I would suggest to everybody, take action, reach out to this excellent team, to to Greg, to Shirag, to Sophie. Thank you very much. You've been an awesome uh, panel today. I think you've shared some really fantastic insights and uh, and your investment expertise and I think anybody that would like to be interested in or anybody who is interested and there's a lot of interest of course there is uh, in UK property is to obviously reach out and uh, to either to ourselves info at REI or directly through Shirag we'll certainly pass on those details through to you as well directly to Sophie and of course with her team with Greg thank you all very much uh, your knowledge and experience for all of you really been uh, truly eye-opening, I think, for all of us. And to our audience, we appreciate your active participation and, and engagement through this webinar. And we've hoped you've gained valuable knowledge and you motivated to act. As Greg says, you know, let's take action. You know, not just uh, sit back and, you know, just take it forward, move forward. And let's do it. So before we close, I just want to remind our audience of our next webinar, next Thursday, same time, 12 to 1, 10 Secrets to Becoming an Expert Landlord and Master of All Property Manager with David Beatty. He's the founder of Chorus Property Group, and he's also a property author. To book, you just click on the link below. There should be a link that should pop up in the box there. If not, just go onto the REI website and you can link there. And then the week after, navigating FICA. And of course, Shirag touched on that earlier on. It's a, it's not only a South African thing, it's an international thing. And it's an international company called DocVox. They're a leader in the space. So you can also earn one CPD point. So once again, thank you to our esteemed panel. It's been wonderful having you, Sophie, Greg, Shirag. It's uh, wonderful. And uh, so if you want to see the recording, I know a lot of people are, please send the recording. Yes, we will send you the recording. We've got you on the registration list. We'll pass it through to you. If you don't get it by email, just go onto the REI website under events and uh, under education. There's replays and it's all underneath there. So once again, to our audience, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to the experts by clicking on the links and, uh, and or to via email. And we wish you all the best on your path to success to everybody. Thank you very much from the team, uh, team Sophie and Greg and Shirag. Thank you very much having you all. For everybody else, stay safe and successful investing until our next webinar at 12 o'clock next week. This is Neil Peterson, our real estate investor, signing out. Thank you all. Thank you.